Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. This is a happy HUD day. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kathy O'Regan, Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research here at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and I'm very happy to see so many of you here in the auditorium today, and I know we have a lot of you joining us on the webcast. For those of you who are viewing the live webcast in particular, I want to encourage you to follow along on Twitter and tweet your questions with hashtag PDRupdate or email your questions to pdnrquarterlyupdate at hud.gov. We're going to be opening up at the end for questions from the audience and we want to get those in. We're going to kick off our quarterly with Kevin Kane, PDNR's chief market analyst, who's going to update us on trends in the housing market with quarterly, the first quarter data from 2015. And then we're going to turn to our panel discussion, investing in people and places for upward mobility. A growing body of research underscores the importance of place in outcomes for children and intergenerational mobility, that low-income children raised in lower poverty neighborhoods do better as adults, independent of other factors. So we're talking about something that when you change, can change the lives for those children. It's especially true for low-income families. Events in Ferguson, Baltimore, and beyond have really highlighted how divided our spaces are, and so too, all the opportunities that come with them. So today, what we're gonna do is focus on how we might do better, how we might better invest in people and places to support upward mobility for low-income families, given the importance of place. We'll consider the range of levers that HUD and others employ. So this is a discussion about how to do better in supporting mobility efforts to get to low poverty neighborhoods and how to do better in investing in neighborhood transformation where people live. We want to focus on lessons learned from what we've already done, intriguing opportunities, uh, and what are the obstacles for getting there. These questions that we're going to focus on today are very much at the heart of HUD's mission, so I think this is going to be a lively and important conversation. So I'm going to first turn over the mic to, Ke uh, to Kevin to start before we move to the panel. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Regan. Please, everyone, remain in your seats. Uh, <clears throat> before I begin, as always, I want to thank Randall Goodnight and Wendy Ipp, uh, who put together all the maps that you'll see in my presentation this afternoon. Uh, as always, a note about the maps. Uh, the color themes of the maps are all the same, uh, where brown indicates worse off conditions or declines in a variable, uh, and blue indicates better conditions or increases. Uh, first, we're going to look at uh, the nation's economy, then we'll talk about uh, the sales and the rental markets. So in this first figure, uh, we see the year-over-year -year percentage change in non-farm payrolls since 2005, uh, looking at both the 12-month and the three-month averages uh, through March of 2015. Uh, non-farm payrolls are a measure of the number of jobs in the economy. Uh, the 12-month average is shown in blue, and the, th the three-month average is shown in red. Uh, during the 12 months ending in March 2015, non-farm payrolls averaged 140 million jobs. Uh, this was up 2.1% or 2.9 million jobs compared with a year ago. Uh, the three-month average through March was up by a higher rate of 2.3% from a year ago. Uh, the rates of growth have been increasing more noticeably since May of 2014, and we've had uh, three-month year-over-year growth at or above 2% since August of 2014. Uh, for the 16th consecutive quarter, every region of the country added jobs relative to a year ago, and you can see the entire country is in blue. Uh, the five regions in darker blue grew at a rate that was faster than the national average, and you can see those in the south and in the west. Uh, growth was led by the northwest at 3.2%, uh, which included four of the top 10 fastest growing metropolitan areas in the country. Compared with a year ago, year-over-year uh, -year rates of growth last quarter, uh, the rates of growth were higher in every region except for New England, uh, where the rate remained the same, and in the Southwest, where it was down from a rate of 3.2%. Uh, total job gains were led by the professional and business services sector, which added 672,700 jobs. Uh, that was a 3.6% increase. Uh, the fastest rate of growth occurred in the construction subsector, 
uh, which was up by 5.3% or 297,000 jobs. And on a state level, Utah had the fastest rate of growth at 4.1%, and this was led by an 8.5% increase in the construction subsector. Uh, 12 states had a rate of growth that was at or above 3%, and West Virginia was the only state to lose jobs, uh, but their rate declined by less than 0.1%. Uh, the national unemployment rate was 5.8% during the first quarter of 2015, uh, this was down from 6.9% a year ago. The five regions in blue had a rate that was less than or equal to the national rate, and that was led by the Rocky Mountains at 4.3%. The five regions in brown had a higher rate than the national average, led by the Pacific at 6.7%. Uh, on a state level, rates ranged from a low of 3% in Nebraska, and I should note it's, it's usually always North Dakota, so this is the first time it hasn't been North Dakota in a while. Uh, to a high of 7.8% in the District of Columbia. Uh, on a national rate, the unemployment rate was down by 1.1 percentage points from last year. Uh, the unemployment rate declined in every region of the country, once again, the whole country in blue. Uh, the two regions in darker blue declined faster than the national average, led by the Midwest, which was down by 1.5 percentage points. Uh, unemployment rates declined in 47 states, as well as the District of Columbia, uh, led by Michigan and Kentucky, which were down by 2.4 percentage points. Uh, Louisiana had the highest increase at 0.9 percentage points. The most recent annual census population data are available. Uh, these are as of July of 2014. Uh, this map shows the annual rate of population growth from 2010 to 2014 at the metropolitan level. Uh, areas in brown had a decline in population, uh, light blue areas ranged from no change to an increase of 1%. Uh, medium blue were up by 1.1 to 2%, and dark blue areas were up by more than 2%. And you can see there's 16 of those areas, and eight of those are located in the southeast region. Uh, most of the western 60% of the country is growing, uh, also Florida and along the east coast. Uh, there have been declines in many areas in the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, and into the Northeast. Uh, let me give an overview of current housing market conditions. Uh, sales market conditions remain relatively balanced throughout most of the country. Uh, as a bit of background, uh, balanced conditions exist when the quantity of housing supplied equals the quantity demanded. Uh, soft markets occur when the quantity of housing supply exceeds the quantity demanded, uh, and we have a surplus. And tight markets uh, occur when demand exceeds supply and we have a housing shortage. Uh, all three home price indices show that home sales prices continue to increase during the first quarter, with the rate of gain remaining relatively stable compared with the previous quarter. Uh, home sales decreased by 1% during the 12 months ending in March 2015. This is according to CoreLogic data. Uh, this is after a 2% decline uh, that we saw last quarter. Uh, inventories of new homes for sale were up by 7.4% from a year ago and they were up 2.6% for existing homes. And based on the current rate of home sales, there's a 5.1 month supply of new homes. This is down from a 5.6 month supply a year ago. And there's a 4.6 month supply of existing homes. This is down from a five month supply a year ago. Uh, the sales vacancy rate was slightly changed, 1.9% uh, in the first quarter uh, from 2% a year ago. Uh, all regions of the country have rental markets uh, that have tight or slightly tight conditions, and 63% of apartments that were completed in the third quarter were absorbed in the fourth quarter of last year. That's the most recent data available. Uh, Multifamily production increased by 8% in the first quarter relative to a year ago. Let's take a look now at regional conditions around the country. Uh, these are assessments provided by our field economists. Uh, relative to last quarter, areas uh, that are shaded in blue had an improvement, uh, and declines in conditions are shaded in brown. So as you can see, not a whole lot of changes going on around the country. Uh, sales market conditions remain relatively balanced in many regions. Uh, tight conditions remain in the Rocky Mountains, and conditions have also become tight in the Northwest, and you can see that shaded in brown. Uh, on the rental side, all regions have some markets that are experiencing tight or slightly tight conditions. Uh, this next figure shows the year-over-year -year change in home price indices. Um, 
And when we look in March 2015, the S&P index, which is shown in blue, was up by 4.1% from a year ago. Uh, the FHFA index, shown in red, was up a little more than 5%. And the CoreLogic index, shown in black, was up by nearly 6% relative to a year ago. Uh, the slowing in the rates of increase seems to be leveling off a bit since September of 2014, uh, according to the FHFA and CoreLogic indexes. Uh, you can see that with the flattening of the curve, uh, but the S&P index is still showing a little bit of a slowdown in prices. Uh, this next map shows the change in the monthly CoreLogic house price index on a state level from one year ago. Uh, nationally, the increase again was 6%. Uh, prices were up or unchanged in all states except for one. Uh, you can see the lone state, Connecticut, uh, shown in brown. Uh, prices in the two lighter shades of blue increased by less than or equal to the national rate of increase, uh, and four of those remained unchanged. And prices in the 11 dark blue uh, colors were up by more than the national average. This was led by a 9% gain in Colorado as well as in South Carolina. Uh, according to the Census Bureau, the median price of a new home in the first quarter was $285,500. Uh, this was up 3.7% from a year ago. And according to the National Association of Realtors, the median price of an existing home uh, was up 6.5% uh, to $203,400 from a year ago. Let's take a closer look at the Northwest region, uh, where prices were up in all 27 metro areas. And 13 of these had an increase that was faster than the national average, uh, again, those shown in dark blue. Uh, this was led by a 13% increase in Lewiston, Idaho. And other notable metro areas in the region, uh, Seattle was up by 8%, and Boise City and Portland were both up by 7%. And only three areas uh, were in the lightest shade of blue, indicating the lowest rates of growth, uh, those up by less than 3%. Uh, this next map shows the percent of home loans 90 or more days delinquent in foreclosure or in REO status uh, as of March of 2015. Uh, REO means that the lender now owns the property. Uh, the national average was 4.3% of all loans in these three categories. This was down from 5.2% in March of 2014. And you can see we've got an interesting split across the country. Uh, the five regions in brown on the eastern half of the country have a rate that's higher than the national average, while the five regions in blue on the western half have a rate that's lower uh, than the national average. Uh, the rate is still high in New York, New Jersey at more than 7.8%. And for the seventh consecutive quarter, the rate declined in every region of the country and also declined in every single state. Uh, the most dramatic decline occurred in the southeast, which was down by 1.4 percentage points to 5.4%. And this was led by a 2.7 percentage point decline in the state of Florida, uh, where the rate there is still the second highest in the country at 7.5%, uh, lower than the 8.8% in New Jersey, which also declined by 1.2 percentage points from a year ago. Uh, the rate uh, also declined by one percentage point in the New York, New Jersey region from a year ago. Uh, the decline in New York, New Jersey was helped by a 36% increase in REO sales in that region. Uh, for perspective, REO sales were down uh, in nearly every other region of the country and many of those decreases by double digits, so a very different trend going on in New York, New Jersey. Uh, based on CoreLogic data, uh, new and existing home sales were down by 1% during the 12 months ending March 2015 compared with a year ago. Uh, and this is now three consecutive quarters that we have seen year-over-year -year home sales declines. Uh, and again, the declines are slight, but three consecutive quarters that we've experienced a decline. Uh, the Pacific in dark brown declined by 6%, followed by 3% in the Midwest and 1% in the other three regions. Uh, the declines in the Pacific included a 10% decline in Hawaii, 8% uh, in Nevada, and 6% in California. Uh, the areas in blue ranged from no change in the Rocky Mountains to a 6% increase in the Great Plains. So let's take a closer look at the Great Plains. Um, in the Great Plains region, uh, this included a 15% increase in Iowa and a 6% increase in Missouri. Uh, in the Great Plains, traditional resales were up by 11%, uh, but new sales were down by 3%. In addition, REO sales were down by 20%, and short sales were down by 8%. Uh, 
Uh, sales were down by 5% in St. Louis. They were down by 2% in Kansas City. Uh, those are both in brown. And the highest rates of growth occurred in Jefferson City, Missouri, uh, in Ames, Iowa, and in Sioux City, Iowa. And you can see those all in the darker shade of blue. Uh, single family home building, as measured by building permits issued, increased by 5% to 132,900 homes during the first quarter relative to a year ago. Uh, this was the same rate of increase that we saw last quarter. Uh, permits were up in six regions, led by the Northwest at 13%, uh, with Washington State up 20%, and Idaho up 19%. The Southwest and the Pacific were both up by 9%. Uh, activity declined in four regions, uh, led by a 34% decline in New England, uh, and this was partially due to the record-breaking snowfalls that they experienced uh, back in January and in February. Uh, the number of multifamily units permitted was up by 8% to 92,000 units during the first quarter. Uh, six of the 10 regions had gains led by double-digit increases in the Northwest of 78%, the Pacific up 41%, New England up 18%, and the Southwest up 10%. Uh, the number of units permitted declined by 40% in the Mid-Atlantic region and by 36% in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, this next map shows the change in the vacancy rates across regions. According to Reese data, the national vacancy rate was up 0.1 percentage points to 4.2% uh, in the first quarter. And this is significant because this is the first time that the national vacancy rate has increased uh, since at least 2011. Uh, rates were up in six regions, and they were unchanged in one region, uh, those all shown in blue. Uh, gains were the highest in the Rocky Mountains at 0.6 percentage points, and the New England uh, region at 0.5 percentage points. Uh, three regions, the Pacific, the Great Plains, and the Midwest, had a decline in vacancy rates, and those are shown in brown. Uh, according to Reese, which covers 275 market areas, Vacancy rates were down in 177 market areas. Uh, they were up in 87 market areas, and they were unchanged in 11 areas. Uh, there were also 11 markets with a decline of two percentage points or more. According to the Census Bureau for the entire US, the rental vacancy rate was 7.1% in the first quarter. This is down from 8.3% a year ago. Let's take a closer look at vacancy rates up in the Northwest region. Uh, this map shows the vacancy rates of metropolitan areas relative to the national rate. Uh, the 11 areas in the two shades of brown had a lower rate than the national average, and the four areas in blue were higher. The largest decline occurred in Salem, uh, down 1.1 percentage points to a current rate of 1.6%. In Seattle, the vacancy rate's at 4.3%. Uh, in Portland, at 3.3%. And in Olympia, at 2%. So you can see these vacancy rates are very low uh, in that region experiencing some tight rental market conditions. Uh, let's take a look at rents. Uh, rents were up by 3.3% nationally, according to Reese, from the first quarter of 2014 to the first quarter of 2015. Uh, rents grew in all regions of the country. Uh, again, the whole country is shown in blue. Uh, the six regions in darker blue increased faster than the national average, and this was led for the second consecutive quarter by the Rocky Mountain region, uh, which was up by 5.9%. Uh, the average market rent in the first quarter for the 275 areas covered by Reese was $1,179. Rents increased in 260 out of the 275 areas. Uh, rents were down in 10 areas, and they were unchanged in five areas. Uh, 58 areas increased by more than the national average. And let's take a closer look at the Mid-Atlantic region, uh, where rent growth was tied for the lowest rate at 2.4%. Uh, rents in the first quarter were up in 23 of the 25 metropolitan areas, all shown in blue. Uh, the light blue areas increased by less than the national average, the dark blue areas uh, by more than the national average, uh, while the brown areas had a decline in rents. Uh, some notable areas uh, in the region, Philadelphia was up by 2.8%, Baltimore by 2.5%, uh, Pittsburgh up by 3.4%, uh, the highest increase in the region, and D.C. was up by 1.9%. Uh, in honor of our discussion on upward mobility, uh, which we're going to have our panel discussion here momentarily, uh, our team put together a couple slides on poverty, 
Uh, this map shows the percentage of the population in severe poverty, uh, which means their income is below one half of the poverty level. Uh, this is showing by metropolitan area around the country. Uh, for the nation, 7% of the population is classified as being in severe poverty. Uh, the metros in blue have percentages lower than the national average, meaning fewer people in severe poverty, while the brown areas have higher percentages than the national average. Uh, the darkest brown areas have the highest concentrations of severe poverty, ranging from 11.1% to 16.8%. Uh, this map illustrates that there are higher concentrations of poverty in the South as well as in California, uh, but you can see the problem is everywhere. Uh, the highest rate in the country is 16.8%, and that's in Gainesville, Florida. And then in this next map, uh, this shows the percent of the population in severe poverty uh, over time. Uh, and this is looking since 1975. Uh, this uses a slightly different source of data than what was in the, the previous map. So uh, the national rate is a little different. We saw 7% uh, uh, before. Uh, this map shows, uh, this figure shows 6.3%, but again, just because different, different data sources. Uh, but you can see that the historic rate seems to fluctuate between about 45 to 6%, uh, but the red trend line indicates that the percent of population in severe poverty uh, is going up over time. Uh, so in summary, Year-over-year uh, -year job growth during the first quarter was 2.3%. Uh, sales markets remain relatively balanced throughout the country. Uh, price gains remain stable relative to last quarter, and total sales declined by 1%. Uh, rental market conditions remain tight or slightly tight in many markets around the country. Uh, rents are continuing to rise, and vacancy rates are continuing to decline in most markets, although, again, the national vacancy rate did slightly increase. Uh, for additional information, please go to the U.S. Housing Market Conditions website on HUDUser.org. Uh, you can talk with your local regional or field economist, or you can feel free to contact me. Uh, thank you very much, and at this time I will hand things back to Dr. O'Regan, who's going to lead the panel this afternoon. standing behind that podium. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Okay, good. But you want me to stay away from that. Okay. Uh, so great. So what I'm going to do now before we move to the panel is I want to take the opportunity to do a little framing uh, to put what we're going to be talking about today in a little bit of context and to sort of speak a little bit from the HUD perspective. So the context. Right, you know, in the United States, we have a, a actually, I, th I would say, a fairly shared value that uh, we pride ourselves on this being a land of opportunity. And one way that you might measure that and try to capture it to see whether it's true is to look at whether or not the outcome for a child in a country is determined by their family's circumstances when the child is born, right? Intergenerational mobility. That's why we focus on it. It tells us something about opportunity. So what do we know about that in the United States? Well, we know that compared, using most measures compared to other countries that are similarly wealthy, like the United States, intergenerational mobility is lower in the United States and has not improved in the last 50 years. One measure of that, an example that's used, is given on the screen, right? So a child born in the bottom fifth of incomes in the US, so the bottom 20%, has a 42% chance of remaining there as an adult. If you wanted a simple comparison, think about Canada, right? Right above, it's more than 10 percentage point less chance for a child similarly situated in Canada. Within the United States, we have large racial differences on how intergenerational mobility plays out, right? So for, a, for white children, if you're born in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, you have a 31% chance of being there as an adult. For a black child, it's 54%, right? So those racial disparities are pretty stark. The fact that mobility has remained constant is one issue. We've been talking about this a lot in national conversation because it's in the context of a country that has high levels of income inequality and where income inequality has been increasing since the 1970s. Today, income inequality in the United States 
is at a level that we have not seen since 1928. And that's income inequality. Wealth inequality, we know, is much more unevenly distributed in the US. So what that means is, if you think about a country where the income inequality is really narrow, you might fuss a little less about immobility because where you land doesn't differ that much from other people because there's very little inequality. The more the inequality grows, the more you should be troubled by and the more we're collectively troubled by immobility. So the conversation about increasing inequality and intergenerational mobility are hand in hand in our sense of whether this is a country with equal opportunity. And I would say that we actually do have very shared values about this, uh, about the, the importance of this being a place and a society of equal opportunity. In fact, we did a little bit of Googling before the, uh, putting the slide together. There was a, um, a, uh, a Washington Post piece that said the one thing the presidential candidates agree on, apparently across party lines, is that economic mobility is the theme of this campaign. And if you Google their speeches, you'll find inequality and economic mobility mentioned throughout. You will actually find more Republican candidates talking about it. But to be honest, you just find more Republican candidates. So it's really not a fair way to be looking at it. But I was starting to tally, and I stopped myself. Um, so that is the context in which this newest research is placed, right? A country that's talking about this, having seen the spatial divides in Baltimore, Ferguson, and beyond, and what that means for access to opportunity. Then we have the rigorous research and the follow-up on the MTO results that says place matters for intergenerational mobility. So low-income children raised in lower poverty places actually do better than similar low-income kids, right? We know that place matters based on that, and we also know there were large disparities in place. The New York Times had an article this morning uh, that was actually citing research from Stanford that showed that the, an African-American family in the US that has middle income lives in a neighborhood with lower income than the average low-income white family. So the neighborhood gap is huge. So what this place work suggests, this research, is kind of a two-prong. It's out of the negative and the positive of this. One is this shows one possible mechanism on why we're seeing these large disparities in this country. And if you flip that around, it suggests we can use place to decrease those gaps, right? So it's, it's, it's a challenge and it's an opportunity. And so that's what we want to focus on today. Given this national conversation, given where we are in thinking about inequality and intergenerational mobility and the importance of place, how can we use that to do better? This is, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, this is going to be inclusive, right? It's the both and of the type of work that HUD and others do. We're going to be looking at mobility policy, and we're also going to be thinking about investing in places. And we want to focus on what we can learn from what we've done to do better. So what I want to do is think first about what HUD is doing right now in, a couple, in these spaces, and I want to think about the different levers, right? I'm going to do this very quickly, but it's the way that we're going to think about a variety of things as we go through the panel. First, when you think about possible levers and mechanisms, you think of one possibility is mobility, right? For HUD, our Housing Choice Voucher program is our greatest example of a type of mobility of getting low-income families into low-poverty neighborhoods. Something that we're looking at right now is a way to improve mobility on this. We're in the comment period for an advance notice on using small area FMRs in metro areas that have particularly concentrated voucher households. It's meant to be a tool to increase mobility in those areas. A little bit of a plug. If you haven't submitted your comments, you have until July 2nd. Um, but we also want to think about mobility efforts on the supply side, right? So there's a lot of research that shows that it's the stability, you want stable access to good neighborhoods and good schools to get these outcomes for kids. So supply side efforts there are really important. And we know there are challenges both in the creation of them and the preservation. And I'm sure that's going to come up in our panel. So the second big lever and bucket of areas that we do, uh, uh, we focus on in this area is thinking about the improvement in the actual places where families live. Not all families want to or can move, and it should not be that your only choices in improving 
outcomes for your kids is to leave the network that you're embedded in and the institutions that you're invested in. Uh, the, our program on choice neighborhoods, I think, is the evolution of where we've gotten to in our best place based efforts. One of the things that we've learned in that approach is the importance of using the limited resources that we have to leverage other resources to have enough at the table and in the neighborhood to have impact. From, a lesson from that that's been translated now into something we've just announced in the last couple of weeks in the most recent RAD notice is a piece of that notice is trying to think about how it is we can prioritize the use of our time to leverage for biggest impact. So in the rental admin, um, uh, assistance demonstration, what we're doing is we're attempting to get rid of that $26 billion backlog that we have in public housing and to leverage private capital to be able to do that. It's a great innovation. What this notice talked about is within the queue of applications and approved deals that we have, we might want to go first to some of the deals that are going to have the biggest impact. You can have your biggest impact when you're investing the most in the housing, and you can also have your biggest impact when you invest more broadly in the community. So a way to prioritize that type of community investment that matters through some of our RAD mechanisms. And I'm going to finish with just our th what I'm almost considering a third category to recognize that these are not two mutually exclusive approaches. There are many strategies that embrace the two and do two at once. And so I specifically want to think about, particularly today, uh, mechanisms and strategies that focus on changing the landscape of opportunity by changing the level of racial and economic segregation in this country. And here, everything that we do in fair housing is related to this. I had many different slides, depending where I was on the weekend and the week, on what I thought I was going to be able to talk about and what might be announced. So this is the slide for the moment. One of our current activities is affirmatively fair uh, furthering fair housing rule, which we have not announced, so that's all I'm going to say about it. What's not on the slide, and I'm thrilled to announce, is the set of tools we get to continue using. Um, the disparate impact case this morning means that something that's critical for actually achieving fair housing is still in the toolkit that we get to use. And so that's the, if I'd been really quick, I would have slipped another slide in here um, between 10 o'clock this morning and now to be able to have, you know, there'd be animation and noise going with it. Um, so what we're going to do, these are the three things, these are three ways to think about buckets of activity that we do here at HUD, but that are done broadly and that we, in all of these areas we do with partners. And so the panel is not focusing specifically on HUD, we're, but we're going to make sure we cover each of these areas and break up into conversation. And so I'm going to move to the panelists now and invite them up to the stage. That would be, and I'm seeing our three panelists. And as they're coming up to the stage, I'm going to apologize in advance. I probably should have warned you that I'm not reading your full bios. Um, not a way to, they're all posted online and we will spend too much time on it. But I do want to highlight a couple of things because we've, I've been a little brutal with the, the panel. I'm not letting people make their full presentations. I'm limiting them to five. And what I've tried to do is we're trying to tier the conversation because we've put a lot in this one panel, right? By being inclusive, it makes it hard to go deep. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in order and focus on a collection of things that help set up the rest of the conversation. And so I'm going to start with Jens Ludwig, a McCormick Foundation Professor of Social Service Administration Law and Public Policy at the University of Chicago. That's only one of his titles, but I said I wanted a light slide, so I had to only pick one title for each person up here. And so Jens is, does a collection of work on urban issues, housing, crime, uh, health, from my perspective, he's going to start us off focusing on research. And one of the two things that you, three things, okay, it's getting longer, three things you have to know about Jens is first, he's been working on research and follow up on the MTO experiment since 1995, okay? So he's been in and knows this and has written considerably in the area. He's also done a collection of work and is actively working now on voucher research in Chicago. And, but you didn't have it in your bio. He's on the advisory board for PDNR's academic journal, The Cityscape. So. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move into talking about mobility. And so Robin Siderman, Snyderman, who is currently, actually you're a resident, a non-resident fellow at Brookings and the principal at Brick, 
and you have 25 years of experience in community development and housing, but where I first met Robin was when she was talking about the mobility work she was doing in Chicago. And so the, here there are some compelling things for her to talk about, both on the approaches to mobility, which both were demand uh, and supply side, and use of data to be able to both make the case for it to motivate and get the political will, and then to think about how to do it effectively with data on the ground on neighborhoods. Then we're going to move to play space. And uh, Carol Naughton, who's now the senior vice president for Purpose Built Communities, but you actually were one of the founders and were recently the, actually, that's wrong. Actually, the you, okay, so this slide, okay, or was the vice, senior vice president up until about three, a month ago, and transitioned, so the slide is already outdated, is now the president, and is gonna talk about a collection of place based work there, and has been in lead role as the community quarterback um, institution in a variety of these efforts, and we'll speak with that. Then, pulling it all together, Mark is gonna, uh, Mark Joseph from Case Western is gonna speak to us about mixed income developments as a tool, this is his passion, as a tool for decreasing concentrated poverty and both having an effect on place and mobility. And Mark is also on the Cityscape board, so Anyone who's listening, anyone who uh, gets, uh, you know, is thinking about Cityscape Board, you get to join all the panels and you get asked to join us for a variety of conversations if you join our board. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jens. Just to, sort of, so we're gonna go right in order and then have some time here as a moderated conversation before opening up to the audience. Great. Oh, and you can do it right from your seats. Yeah, uh, so what I was gonna do is, um, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Kathy, for, uh, for inviting me. You uh, might be wondering how someone who looks like he's 16 could have worked on moving to opportunity for 20 years. Uh, that's just one of the many mysteries of the moving to opportunity uh, experiment. <laughs> So what I want to do is I want to just talk a, a very briefly about uh, the latest findings from Moving to Opportunity, which have come as a big surprise to many of us, and I'm sure that'll come up a lot more during the Q&A. But um, as most of the people here in the room know, there's been a very active program of research sponsored by PDNR over the last 20 years on Moving to Opportunity that has uh, found very important impacts on health outcomes and important impacts on the sense of subjective uh, well-being that families experience. Um, no detectable impacts up to this point, no detectable impacts up to this point. Uh, oh, okay, I see what, uh, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a mechanism for passing the, the clicker along. No detectable impacts up to this point on the outcomes that Congress was most focused on when they originally authorized MTO, which was earnings and educational outcomes for kids. Um, until very recently. So within, say, the last month or two, a new working paper was put out by Raj Chetty and Larry Katz at Harvard, which now uses IRS tax data that follows up families for several years longer than we had been able to follow families up to this point, which now finds increases in college attendance rates for, but only for the children in MTO who were age 13 or younger at baseline and finds very sizable increases in earnings during adulthood, again, only for the children who are 13 and under at the time the families move. There might, if anything, could be some negative impacts, if anything, for children who are adolescents when their family signed up for MTO or for the adults in the household. These are not super precisely estimated, but now there are a lot of obvious questions that this raises for both research and for policy that I assume will come up during the Q&A session. What I want to do is just very briefly use the last two and a half minutes that I have to mention, um, I don't think you should count the time that I'm passing the mouse back and forth no, against my, okay, it. excellent, all right. Um, I want to talk about, I think, three uh, observations from these latest findings that are slightly less obvious, but I think very important to, to think about. So one, I think, very important implication of the latest MTO findings is that social science theory is terrible. <laughs> so literally up until the day before the new Raj Chetty Larry Katz paper came out, literally up until the day before, I could find you thousands of papers by social scientists saying, what idiot could have expected moving to opportunity to change the educational outcomes or earnings outcomes of poor families? Everyone knows it is 
racial segregation or whatever other neighborhood measure was not changed by, you have to live in the suburbs, you have to live in a lily white neighborhood, all of these other, um, and then the next day, the Roger Chetty Larry Katz paper comes out and shows 30% increases in earnings for kids who are 13 and under from moves that were characterized by none of the things that the social scientists claimed were incredibly important based on social science theory. This makes you realize that social scientists are just making it up as they go along. Our theories have almost no predictive power, and I think that that is incredibly important from policy design to bake in the appropriate level of intellectual humility about what it is about these communities that is really important, because there are a lot of different things about these communities and they all take money to change, and we don't know. That's uh, uh, non-provocative observation number one. Here's non-provocative observation number two, is I think consistent with Kathy's, uh, uh, there's a lot of focus now on uh, things like social mobility, which is really about when I look at low-income kids today, what happens to their lives when they're adults? These are policy concerns about the long-term life outcomes of children. What do we do in Washington, D.C. and in states and cities around the country? We implement a bunch of social policies, and we don't want to wait 30 or 40 years to see what happens to people. We want to know today. And so what we do is we do our policies and our programs, and then we look at some short-term marker that we hope is predictive of the long-term impact of these policies. And so observation number two is our short-term short markers are terrible, right? So if you look at the long-term MTO report, you will see that there are no detectable changes in achievement test scores, even for the kids that Raj and Larry find go to college more and experience increased earnings. You will see that there are no detectable changes in high school graduation rates, even for the cohorts of kids who go to college more often. And yet we see that they're going to college more and they're earning a lot more. This poses a huge challenge for public policy because it means that when we do policies and programs, it is very, very hard for us to know without waiting whether these things are actually working and achieving the long-term benefits that we, that we want. That is a huge problem. Let me say one more thing. You are counting the mouse time against me. So I am, uh, I'm gonna say my third thing. Um, here's the third thing that I want to I want to say is um, so the Raj Chetty and the Larry Katz paper came out and we finally see uh, changes in earnings for people and, and moving to opportunity and you can feel this incredible sense of elation and relief in the housing policy world and the social science world. This is great. Finally, we can feel like moving to opportunity worked. Finally, we can feel that. This is a very, very weird thing, because when you go back and you look at the Moving to Opportunity long-term report, what you see are things like reductions in depression prevalence on the order of, say, 30 to 50%. You see reductions in extreme obesity. You see reductions in diabetes of enormous magnitudes. We don't seem to care about that. That is a very, this is a little bit extreme, but you can see how the mood, you can contrast the new mood about MTO with the old mood about MTO as the most revealing way about how little weight we really put on these other outcomes. This is a very weird thing because if I went to you and said, I've got a deal for you, I will increase your annual earnings by $3,000 and give you diabetes. How does that sound? Nobody in their right mind in this room would think that that was anything like a good deal. And yet, when I take away your diabetes, we're like, uh, who cares? I think that this is a very, very profound point for social policy because it's very easy for us to lapse into the habit of thinking that what we are trying to do is reduce poverty. And instead, my own view is that we should have a broader lens and think about what we're trying to do as improving the lives of poor families. And those are definitely not the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Jens might not look like he's been doing this work for 20 years, but also coming from Chicago, I now know that I have been doing this for 25 years because I have to apologize. I need bifocals. I just realized it when I got here today. Um, thank you for including me today with such a accomplished, high-impact group of panelists. And thank you, Catherine, and all the folks at HUD for their dedication to data-driven solutions and innovation. 
Brick is a newish firm, only three years old. We're really focused in this space of community building, capacity building, and collaboration building, especially in the suburbs in housing and community development. And um, I'm happy to say that we see a real appetite, appetite out there among public and private sector leaders for paradigm shifts to promote economic mobility if they've got the right partners and the right capacity. And I think this theme of capacity building that I know others will touch on is um, a real demand and a real opportunity for all of us. Oh, I forgot to use the clicker here. Okay, so um, what, what I'm gonna quickly touch on is, is two case studies, two promising initiatives that we hope are both replicable and scalable. Um, that have greatly benefited from the Brookings Institution work on confronting suburban poverty. Um, one is called the Regional Housing Initiative, and I know there are a few people in this room who've been involved in that for a number of years. And another is a new initiative um, that Cook County has been working on called Planning for Progress. Um, the premise of the Brookings work on confronting, oops, <laughs> on confronting suburban poverty, which is led by the authors uh, Elizabeth Nebone and Alan Berube, two senior fellows at Brookings, is that the geography of poverty and opportunity are changing and that we need a new agenda for um, metropolitan opportunity. And I think all of us who are part of these discussions about upward mobility often um, talk about opportunity areas and some of us think we know what that means and some of us are still trying to figure it out. But I think the implications of this research shows that even what many people consider opportunity areas aren't necessarily as ripe and as ready as, as we hope. Um, okay, the, the reality that most of us are still, that most of us still find counterintuitive but will require all of us to get in gear to address is that there are now more people living in poverty outside of the big cities and in the suburbs than in the cities themselves. This happened overnight sometime in 2000 when none of us noticed, okay? And this creates, these are actually Brookings slides, obviously a lot of challenges for communities that don't have transit, don't have the philanthropy, don't have the infrastructure of social services. But they have some very cool slides about the 81 programs worth $82 billion coming out of 10 agencies that are very focused on place-based solutions in the urban core and you know how you move that into the suburbs is, is pretty tough. But the book and the corresponding website, which is kept up to date, really features a few case studies and best practices that make these three recommendations to the rest of us. So this is what's already proving helpful on the ground. One is really thinking about these issues at the right scale. So you're gonna, again, hear from panelists working at the community level, at the city level, but how do you think about this, say, at the regional level? Um, how do you really promote the sort of integration, housing, jobs, transportation, um, again, at, at this new scale? And how do you fund to reward this? Um, so in terms of the two case studies, but, um, the, they're both coming from the Chicago region, an area really that jumped on some of this Brookings research. Um, and this is the kind of slide that policy advocates like to use to show what we're up against in Chicagoland, how hard it is to address things at the right scale when you have this many local jurisdictions and taxing districts and really inequity and, and um, economic segregation in the Chicago region. But what we find is that, you know, this is the people that get the slide, like people in this room, you guys have an appetite for policy change. But so many of our stakeholders and our, our voters and our elected officials don't necessarily have the self-interest at this moment um, in, in promoting the sort of policy change. So this is the slide we use more for, for this audience. And, um, you know, it was in the, you know, since the 90s when we've been watching the, the the job growth and population growth go, grow in the suburbs. We've been thinking, how do we bring aboard the municipalities, the public housing authorities, the employers really needed to be part of the change and what incentives are there at every level of government to support them? And this stoplight map shows red the areas where local workers can only afford, green is where they can afford to rent and own, yellow is only rent and red is neither. And green isn't necessarily the good place to go in the Chicago region, this is where the highest percentage of foreclosures are the south suburbs. So this helps employers and municipal leaders understand why they need to address these things at the right scale. So now a minute in each <laughs> on the two um, case studies. One of them, the Regional Housing Initiative, again, grew out of the data that we were, we, were, we were seeing at this point in time when the 
the jobs were changing, and we were sitting at a table with a lot of the Gautreau advocates and the housing authorities and the academics, and the housing authorities were the tools that, that were preserved in today's court case were getting used to really you know, to, to sue and to beat up and appropriately so in some cases. But there was also this shocking realization from the study that in a lot of the opportunities where we, areas where we wanted to see rental housing, there was not a supply. That the little housing authorities didn't have the capacity to contribute um, to the sort of development that was going on and that there wasn't even the affordable rental in place to allow the vouchers. So this initiative started with initially three now it's nine of the region's 14 housing authorities pooling their tenant-based vouchers, converting them to be project-based. HUD allows, what, 20%? They're just pooling 10% of their turnover, really, so just a tiny bucket, this pilot, to promote more supply-side solutions in opportunity areas. And in the last few years, this has been going on for about 10, HUD through um, an extraordinary admin line, supported further innovation so that there's a regional waiting list now that accompanies this, and did a real robust add-on to this program with portability and tenant-based mobility counseling as well. And I'll give a shout out for the conference that PRAC and um, MPC and others are doing in Chicago July 16th where the, re where the evaluation that RAND did on the tenant-based piece will be out. But what we know right now from, that, from the project-based side of it is that there are now 30 new developments out there. Only 400 subsidies have been used to create about 2,000 mixed income and supportive housing units. We know that the families moving into these properties are more diverse than the families who lived there before and that um, you know, they're going to better schools and those sort of immediate outcomes that we could see. But a big trick to getting these developments approved was the work with suburban mayors to use criteria that they were comfortable with so that the housing was well managed and well designed, near jobs, near transit, affordable to the local workforce and a range of others. This was a pilot that now we are trying to institutionalize through our Metropolitan Planning Organization, CMAP, which has taken this sort of subjective criteria that was approved by the suburban mayors and overlaid it with the new fair housing equity assessment metrics and other tools for our uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, and it's really proving useful. So the role of an MPO in all of this, I hope that we have a chance to come back to that. Um, okay, the second initiative that I wanted to just briefly touch on is um, planning for progress, which uh, what just, just shows you how quickly leadership can make a difference in a county as complex. Did I already pass my time? Okay, so I'll just be 30 seconds here. When President Preckwinkle took over in Cook County, she already um, was benefiting from the lessons learned from the Sustainable Communities Initiative. She was seeing the value of communities working across borders at the right scale, not reinventing, um, housing policies and getting the, the, the legal solutions correct and getting the city councils on board and getting the mayors on board, you know, one ton at a time, but getting a sub-regional approach focused on rail and, and job corridors across borders. And she wanted her administration to embrace this and to think about housing and jobs and transportation all at the same time. But as her dedicated staff started to really get into the weeds, they realized that their report to HUD and their report to EDA made it almost impossible <laughs> for them to focus on these two things at the right time to get these nonprofits together. And so they, they secured support from HUD and EDA to focus on these issues at the right time. And we're already seeing um, philanthropy, banks, um, the business community coming together to figure out how they can add value to what the public sector leadership is doing. So again, it took, it took these range of voices, the, this new data, to um, think differently about this. And I'll just close with the fact that um, the, the big challenge that Brookings is putting out there with the $82 billion is that if we could just take 5% of it to allow this kind of innovations across border and across discipline and, and give a lot of flexibility, it, from my perspective, it seems that so much of the new work coming out of HUD right now is all about this, but all of the existing programs that the housing authorities are struggling with really make it difficult to reward the sort of innovation needed to go the distance at the right scale. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hold on to your seatbelts. I'm going to go really fast. Um, let's see. Thank you, sir. 
Um, I work for purpose-built communities, and we're a not-for-profit consulting group that helps local leaders implement a very specific kind of neighborhood revitalization. We believe that neighborhoods matter, and when you're thinking about revitalization on the ground, neighborhood is the right scale to think about. So we're going to talk quickly about Eastlake, which was the, um, the basis for the purpose-built model and what we're doing and kind of what we think our, our key learnings are. We believe, like everybody I think in this room, that place and people are important and that we can't separate one from the other. That, but in our model, what we do, we focus on creating great places that lift people up and help them reach their full potential. Um, my nickname at work is Mixed Income Woman. And so I am a true believer in the power of mixed income executed well as creating a great platform for people to be able to reach their full potential. But it's not just housing alone. Let me share with you back in Eastlake, back in 1995. This will look familiar to a lot of you. Eastlake was a neighborhood that by every measure was struggling. Uh, the crime rate was 18 times the national average. Um, almost everybody was going to be the victim of a felony every single year. Andy Young used to say that the only time the haves and the have-nots came together in Eastlake was over the $35 million a year drug trade. The housing stock was 100% public housing, 1970 vintage. It was failing from the day it opened in terms of it, both from a, um, a building construction standpoint and then isolating and warehousing and marginalizing people who live there. By the mid-1990s, 40% uh, of the units didn't meet ha HUD's habitability standards. Hardly anybody worked. In the mid-1990s, if you could walk and chew gum in Atlanta, people were throwing job offers at you. But for some reason, people who lived in East Lake Meadows were divorced from the labor economy. And we, we didn't understand why. Only 13% of adults worked. Uh, average income was about $4,500 a year. Um, almost 60% of families relied on welfare as their primary source of income. But when we looked at education together, this is what was most stunning to us, to see that the kids who lived in our neighborhood went to one of the lowest performing schools in the state of Georgia. Only 5% of fifth graders could pass the state math test, and less than 30% of young people graduated from high school. Collectively, when the residents of East Lake Meadows, the Housing Authority representatives, and the East Lake residents looked at this together, we said, tinkering around the edges is not going to change outcomes for families in this community. We need to do something really disruptive and really different. And we spent three years planning, building trust, building relationships. We could spend all day on that. We're going to put a pin in that and move on. And this is what we came up with after, um, after that three-year planning process and the five-year implementation phase. Crimes down 70, over 70% overall, uh, down, almost down over 90% on violent crime. Uh, the housing stock has dramatically changed. It's a uh, lovely mixed income. We still call it new, even though it's 15 years old. It looks new. It's been very well maintained. It continues to attract people across uh, race and income. In our case, it's 50% public housing, 50% um, um, market rate, and unlike New York, there are no poor doors. Um, you cannot tell where somebody lives based on what apartment they rent. Um, employment is up dramatically. The families who receive public housing subsidy, virtually everybody works unless they're elderly or disabled, and the working public housing families' incomes are five times higher than they were back in the mid-1990s. Um, but it's around education that we are most excited because we're seeing extraordinary outcomes for the young people in our neighborhood. There are now 1,700 ch children who go to Charles Drew Charter School. 98% meet or exceed state standards. Um, Two-thirds of them exceed state standards. It's one of the top performing schools in the state of Georgia while continuing to be true to its mission of serving low-income kids who live in the neighborhood. Over 60% of kids qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, during this time, um, we had lots of people coming to visit us in Eastlake, including Sean Donovan um, when he was uh, like in his first month at HUD. Mm -hmm. And we had to step back and say, okay, what did we really do? What were the levers of success? And we came up with a, a really clear model of what the Eastlake revitalization was, and that's become the purpose-built model. First is a neighborhood intervention. It's not citywide, it's not region-wide, it's a deep dive into a small geography that people would re recognize as a neighborhood. Within that neighborhood, there were three key strategies that were implemented simultaneously. The first was around high-quality mixed-income housing. The second was building a cradle through college education pipeline that starts with really high quality early learning and lifts young people up through college and career. And the third piece around, was around community wellness. And for a long time, we conflated health care with wellness. We've gotten a lot smarter about that now, and we think about it much differently, that health is writ large. But our secret to success is a community quarterback. 
a single purpose nonprofit whose only reason for existence is to drive this revitalization through, to work with the community to create the vision and then work with the partners to implement it over time. I ran this community quarterback for eight years before starting Purpose Built in 2009. So Purpose Built is working with folks all over the country now. We are a not-for-profit consultant. We don't charge for what we do. We look for places where this can be successful. And so right now we've got 12 network members. We're dancing with 20 other cities around the country. And our expectation is in the next few years we'll be supporting 25 neighborhood revitalizations that use this model. I'm going to brag quickly. When I talk about how great kids are doing at Drew Charter School, these are the kinds of outcomes that we're seeing. Um, our school was the lowest performing school the very first year that we started, and now it's one of the very highest performing in Atlanta. Um, I could pick any grade, any subject, and the, and the grades would look like this. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight, and if anybody tells you it happens overnight, they're lying to you. I say this coming from Atlanta, and you all know what I'm talking about. Um, slow, steady, incremental change, making mid-course corrections, getting better at what we do. And I want to say one thing about this. Good enough is not good enough for the neighborhoods that we care about. I think that's one of the false, falsehoods that we think about in community development. If we get to be kind of okay, that's good enough. The families we care about, the neighborhoods we care about deserve better. And then finally, if I was going to show you just one slide about Eastlake, this would be it. This compares kids um, at Drew Charter School with all the fancy pants schools on the north side of Atlanta. The schools that everybody recognizes are great schools where very wealthy people send their kids to. And you see the Drew Charter School compares favorably with all of them. The black line represents the state of Georgia's average. The red line is Atlanta Public Schools average. So you can see that what we're looking at here are just the elite schools. But take a look at that box below the chart. That's the percentage of free and reduced lunch at each of these schools, and then the value of, or the sales price of homes for sale in the neighborhood. Drew Charter School is doing this while serving a percentage, serving a population that is 61% free and reduced lunch, and outperforming all these schools that um, serve very few kids of low wealth. And so this model can work. That I say it's about excellence, it's about long-term commitment, and it's about a community quarterback. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be back. This is my second quarterly, so it's always good to be back at these. Thanks for the invitation, Kathy. Yes. Uh, let me start with my overall takeaway. So I am going to talk about mixed income development, as Kathy said. Um, number one, it is a key strategy, I believe, and an important part of this conversation about promoting upper mobility. But I think we're not yet seeing the potential bang from the buck that we could across the field. And I want to talk about why that is. And so third, I think we're going to need much more intentionality and much more strategic use of resources in mixed income developments to get the kind of bang from the buck we should be seeing around upward mobility. So first of all, I want to make sure the audience is aware of the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. It's our mixed income center at Case Western Reserve University. If you care about mixed income neighborhoods and communities, this is a place to go for information and uh, research. One of the uh, resources that we have uh, on our site is a database. And at this point, we have got about 300 mixed income developments. So if you want to browse, get a sense of what the field looks like, we've got a, a database there that is available and is growing, both in terms of information and number of sites um, all the time. Our research includes two types, one looking at specific cities. And so you can see them listed here on this slide. So there's several where we've done uh, in-depth research. But the second type is scans of the field, and we're just finishing up our second. The first was on the issue of social dynamics in about 30 mixed income developments, and the one that's coming out is on resident services in 60 mixed income developments. So keep an eye on our site and you'll see that, or sign up for our newsletter and we'll send that out to you. So I said a moment ago that we should expect more bang from our buck in mixed income developments, and I want to quickly pause and say why, right? What is it about mixed income developments? And actually, I would make an argument there are several things. Number one, you're intentionally creating, and Carol just talked about it, and when you see the pictures and take the tours, high quality, beautiful housing as a very stable platform for other things in people's lives. So you're intentionally creating that in the setting. Second, it's not just the development itself, but in many cases, the neighborhoods are also beginning to get safer. Um, I know Jens might talk about the issue of safety and crime later, but we're seeing safe neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods are more safe, they're more orderly, another good platform to then advance yourself in terms of uh, your economic situation. 
There should also be more opportunity in the revitalizing neighborhood around you, potentially jobs and other connections. And in mixed income developments, very often there are dedicated services, both pre-occupancy and post-occupancy. So it's not only the housing, but there are also services on top of that. We also hope to see the whole idea behind mixed income development is to move away from concentrated poverty environments to a place where there's a mix of different kinds of people, different kinds of backgrounds. And so those of you familiar with the notion of bridging social capital, you would hope to see that translating into networks that then could give access to information and jobs. There's a notion of role modeling. This is a little more controversial, but you certainly hear it all the time in terms of the loss of role models in the inner city and that mixed income developments would expose families, expose kids to a broader range of role models. Again, we can debate that one. And then finally, there is a screening and selection reality. If you make it into one of these mixed income developments, you've cleared many hurdles and barriers to get in there. So you've already shown you're a person with some grit. So we've got folks with grit that we're working with. Surely we should be able to take them the next step in terms of getting on a different trajectory economically. One reason is uh, that mixed income development is hard to study and to build evidence around uh, as a field, as a strategy, is displayed on the chart, uh, which is very difficult to define what mixed income actually means. And so what you're looking at is 51 different developments, and you're basically looking at 51 levels of mix. So when you say, what is mixed income, we're going to have to parse that more, and we could come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, when I was here the last time, I showed this five-part success framework. So it's just to remind you that there are many ways we could talk about success in mixed income developments. Today, we're going to focus on what's in red, which is uh, promoting upward mobility. So what's the state of the field? We just, as I said, did a scan of 60 developments and asked them about the resident services. And here's what we're learning. First of all, there's increasing investment. I think that the developers, the owners, the property managers are realizing that the housing alone is not going to take people and change their circumstances. It's changing where they're living, but as far as a different economic trajectory, more is needed. And so you're seeing greater investment in services across the different places. So of the 60 um, sites that we surveyed, 47 had found some way to offer resident services uh, to the folks living there. And 22 of them were offering a pretty full suite of what we would call upward mobility services, case management, employment support, financial literacy, asset building. So you're seeing more investment in these services. You're also seeing some of the larger developers, and Eastlake is a great example, of not only just offering programs and services, but really coming up with a model. And so Carol just presented to you the purpose-built model but pushing to say, based on the evidence about what works, how can we put together a model that we then want to apply in a standard way and learn from? Speaking of learning, we're also seeing more tracking, better performance tracking um, of the sites. Two thirds of us told us that they track uh, outcomes for residents who are engaged in their services, but only one third had an actual database where they could track that information electronically. So they're still just getting into the process of tracking and learning and building evidence and knowledge. There are challenges, challenges of sustaining resident engagement in these services, challenges of getting staff, and Robin mentioned capacity earlier, and I hope we'll come back to that. Often they partner with local organizations to provide services, and then the challenge of sustaining the resources for the services over time, right, where do those resources come from. Let me end with this slide, which then gets to the question we all want to know, which is outcomes. And unfortunately, we have very limited evidence at this point about what's working in mixed income developments to promote upward mobility. We have some evidence that concerns me, which is some mature developments that do needs assessment, and you see continued high levels of deprivation among the low-income households in those uh, circumstances, which seems to me clear evidence that simply being in the mixed income development alone is not translating into the kind of broader changes we would like to see. We do see some program level evidence of success with individuals, but we need more evidence about increases in employment, earnings, retention, and then the kind of big question is the duration over time. Is that kept uh, over time and sustained? So we need more rigorous evaluation. I'm going to stop there so that we can get into the Q&A and maybe come back uh, in a second to other. Incre incredibly good at sticking with time. I realize the, the obnoxiously large time signs that are here in the front are, uh, may have contributed to that. That's great. Um, and you each left pieces that you want to get back to, so I want to, I, I'm going to ask very broad questions so you can go back to the pieces of this. One of the things that we, we actually got to talk over lunch, one of the things we 
we wanted to get to first is lessons learned, right? Um, and you've, a couple of piece, pieces have already been named. Coming back to thinking about capacity, I know we want to do that. Uh, relationship building showed up in three of, of the places. And um, one of the pieces that you did say, Mark, that you think you've learned something about is how the mixed income developments can help us learn distinctly both for mobility and for place-based. And I wanted to give you another couple of minutes to come back to that part since you, I basically took it off your Thank list. You. Very <laughs> nice extension. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll jump right on that. I think what we've learned is that where we hoped that getting folks into better housing, better neighborhoods, we could then say, great, we've got you there, let's move on to the next family, but then we're not finished. And there's gonna be another level of intentionality needed in terms of the types of services and supports to help that family get connected in a durable way to the local marketplace and to a way to support their families without the need ultimately for government assistance, which is part of the goal. So what does that mean? I think that it means more strategic bundling of services and really thinking about pushing for synergy across different services. I mentioned the list, so for example, employment support, financial literacy, asset building and saving. Um, so combining those, right, being strategic, so it's not just that one family might get one and another family gets the other, What's the work you need to do to make sure that one household is benefiting from those? And I'm sure Carol could talk about doing that at multiple generations. Mm -hmm. So you want to be working with the parents mm -hmm. and with the kids. The staff and partner capacity, I think, is another piece, right? And particularly because folks are going to be working in so many cases through partnering, contracting with another organization, but how do you get them exposed to whatever that model is of change and have, then hold them accountable to deploying that? as opposed to having different partners each doing their own thing. So there's another level of coordination. And again, Carol gave an example of the community quarterback. Some of us talk about in Collective Impact as a backbound organization. Who's pulling these strategies together? So that's number one is more intentionality. And just as an example, um, Jobs Plus, another round of Jobs Plus is being rolled out. And that's one program that's really showed some evidence around changing economic mobility. And what's special about that is the synergy across three different program components. So I have an idea of kind of a Jobs Plus in mixed income developments might be an example um, of what we're talking about here. Secondly, and very quickly, uh, the notion of activating the mix. As you heard what I said earlier, I do believe that the notion of economic integration should provide potential resources and assets among residents in that community. But what we've learned is that's not going to happen naturally. And in fact, in some cases, you're seeing the us versus them staying and maybe becoming worse over time. So what's the work that's happening in those communities to get over those social barriers, activate the mix, so that you could see families beginning to serve as peers, as supports for each other within that context. It won't happen alone, but I think there's things we know in other places. I'll mention Circles USA, which is a national program that's got some press, for connecting people from different economic backgrounds as peers, as coaches. I'd love to see us try to do that in a mixed income setting. So just to follow up on that and thinking about where it is that you would expect to have the impacts, one of the points that's been made across conversations has to do with the length of time we ought to expect it to take to see change. Um, and I think I wonder if whether or not we haven't done ourselves a little bit of disservice on talking about housing as a platform as though all you need is housing, regardless of what you bring with you from potentially decades of deprivation and right. issues. Generations. Generations, Generations right? right? So right. I, 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 I think we, you know, that, you know, the beginning to change the expectation of what it would mean to support a trajectory, an up trajectory. But on the, on the, the, the connection across the mix, I would think the generational difference here would be large, right? So what you would think would happen for somebody raised in a mixed income development for the type of networks they are in versus somebody who comes to it, actually maybe potentially even feeling like an other, right? I, that, I, are you doing anything looking at different, at the kid level versus Not adults? yet, but I think that's exactly the direction to go in, right? I mean, a lot of these cases, like you look at Choice, for example, that's going to be a wonderful learning ground, but the reality yeah. is the Choice neighborhoods are in the financing, building, construction mode. It's going to be still a couple years before we're really seeing the mixed income communities come out of the ground, and then kids being raised in that setting. I think what we can do is be very, very smart about what do we want to learn from that and begin putting that in place now as those communities come out of the ground. But right now the focus has been on kind of kids in education and adults uh, getting into jobs. And I think that could be an a, um, implication of the Chetty research is 
start thinking about the kid piece now because we might be learning something down the road. Yeah. Of course, then we need people to fund that kind of research and yeah. stay with it for the long term. Yeah. But I think these are key questions we're going to want to know. I've, had, I've been trying to switch the way that we HUD respond to questions about self-sufficiency. 39% of, our, of the people we assist are children. And so our biggest impact on self-sufficiency for that group is their trajectory in life. And we can think about what we're doing in the housing instability in terms of them first on um, self-sufficiency and then go to the next level. So Carol, you've actually got the adults and the families right there in the neighborhood. Are you, are you seeing some differences in the way? I mean, you focused a lot on the education component, yeah. which is at the, for the younger. Yeah, and, and because our, our approach from day one has been to break the intergenerational cycle yeah. of poverty, we have always looked at um, primary investments in children, but, but that doesn't mean we leave adults mm -hmm. behind. So um, we've had some great workforce development programs and other programs in Eastlake and our, at our other network members. Uh, sites, but one of the things that we've learned is that when we think we've got it planned, to your point, um, when we think we've got a great program, two years into it, we'll look and say, oh, it's not working quite the way we thought it would. What do we need to do? What kind of mid-course corrections do we need? And, and it's important to give yourself the flexibility to make those mid-course corrections because what you thought about in a planning room, even a good planning room with all yeah. the right people in the room, isn't necessarily what you're going to learn when you get on the ground. So I, I think one of the things that we've learned is make those mid-course corrections. Don't be afraid to. So let me ask a, a push on that because sure. that was one of the things I wrote down on your, on your course. And it makes perfect sense to us. And then when I think how do we fund and how do we yeah. oversee, yeah. we do it and let's check whether it works. And if it doesn't work, you might not get funding. Yeah, and so yeah. the ability to do, the, to be in a safe place, to be developing what works doesn't, isn't always there. So mm -hmm. was part of this the way that you were funded to be able to do that? Uh, um, we, we have a very complicated braided funding stream <sighs> that it. includes um, public funding. Um, mm -hmm. It included um, a, for, for you old timers out there, an MROP grant that was converted to development funds and flexed like Hope Six for the construction, but there were no money available then um, for supportive services in the neighborhood. So the role of the Eastlake Foundation and its ability to go out and raise money to bring philanthropic dollars to the table turned out to be um, very important, but also gave us a level of flexibility that you might not have with government funds. And we had funders at the table who knew we were trying to do something that had not been done before, and frankly, um, we're frustrated. I, I, I call the, the mm. folks who started our work as frustrated philanthropists, that mm -hmm. they wanted to try to invest in a way that would help break that cycle of poverty long term. So they weren't just looking for results in two or three years. They were looking to say, okay, what do we need to do to create the right kind of place that will, and then put the right kind of programs in there that allow folks to maximize their potential. So we did have a little bit more flexibility perhaps than mm -hmm. if you're working with government funds. Mm -hmm. But there are philanthropic dollars out there. So one of the things that I wanted to hear more about, uh, uh, Robin, was the way that you used the Fair Housing Equity Assessment in doing th this work. And you know, obviously, I, obviously HUD is interested yeah. in the way data like that can be used as we sit here pulling together a collection of data for other efforts. Yeah, we're, um, the, the Fair Housing Equity Assessment metrics were given to our regional planning organization mm -hmm. with the Sustainable Communities Initiative Award. But the, the HUD funding that we got for that regional housing initiative actually predated our MPO's ability to get the metrics. So we got an early version of it, really to define at a regional level what opportunity means. And it was, you know, historically in the Chicago region, and I, I think we hear this across the country, that the people who are really focused on fair housing are sometimes a very different group of people that are focused on neighborhood-based right. development and people who are thinking about regional planning and sensible growth. So even though we might see all of you, we see each other as allies and HUD is working mm -hmm. with them all, when it came down to our legislature, we were often arguing about what the priorities were. With limited resources, we, we didn't have a strategy for figuring out when to move on which issues. And so the fair housing, metri the fair housing equity assessment gave us um, a common set of metrics to say, where are the opportunity areas? Where are the concentrated areas? What are the priorities for moving forward with both? And, and it took us a long time to get consensus, but all nine of the participating housing authorities agreed to use these metrics. And now that our MPO is taking ownership of the program, it was 
for, for, for oh, more than 10 years, it was piloted by an independent nonprofit, the Metropolitan <coughs> Planning Council. Now our, our MPO is using it as a tool in its FHEA um, handbook. And mm -hmm. the county is one of seven counties in CMAP's footprint, and as it moves forward with its Planning for Progress initiative and is thinking sub-regionally, even in Cook County, 130 municipalities, right? The, many in the north and the northwest are very traditionally defined opportunity areas with good schools and good jobs and good transit. Whereas in the south where there's all the affordable housing, they, they need more jobs and they need neighborhood stability. And again, we've got consensus um, at the county level and at the region level for how the nonprofit should be moving toward implementation. But a lot of this has been getting back to Carol's earlier point as well, getting the right quarterback, mm -hmm. right, at, at different levels so that each town isn't figuring this out at their own, right? They've got sub-regional coordination that's linked to the regional coordination. And the metrics help us pr track the progress. Yeah. Did I answer your question? You did. Okay. You did. And I'm also just thinking that as other uh, jurisdictions may go down this path, having been for used it and going through, that you'd be a good resource. And you're, you know, thinking about it's, you know, going back to how we do corrective course. Whoever mm -hmm. has led figuring out a particular model and approach, you need we need better methods for getting that back to the next group so they're not going down the same set of steps. So I want uh, the researcher in me has got to get back to Jens to ask a follow-up question. As a social science researcher working on policy, as far as I can see, all three of your big issues um, undermine my ability to do research. And I'm kind of curious with that combination. In policy. In policy. No, and policy. And policy, yeah. yes. So, yeah, so uh, everybody in the room can quake on it all, not just, not just the researchers. But how does this feed back into how you think about? So what are the changes for the way that we look at policy research um, that can help address some of this? <clears throat> we're not going to have 20 years, you know, 20 years is not the horizon in which we're going to be testing and looking at effects for all of our yeah. interventions. You know, it... Um... I think one of the things that it suggests is that we need to um, really think, really rethink our idea of short-term performance metrics. Yeah. You know, we, uh, it's, it's very, so everybody is out, you know, I live on the south side of Chicago and I go around and interact with a lot of um, nonprofits trying to do very difficult things under incredibly challenging circumstances. They have 10 million things going on and the last yeah. thing in the world that they want to do is have some nerd from the University of Chicago yeah. come in and say, here's one more thing for you to worry about. Yeah. But it really does just seem so fundamentally important for us to have better short-term indicators about whether what we're doing. So here's another way to say it. You cannot do short, you cannot do course corrections without a windshield, right? right? Okay. And, and we need a better windshield to be yeah. able to, uh, to do this. And I think that there is a whole, kind of program of research that needs to be done for HUD, but lots of other agencies that are worrying about these sorts of issues to figure out that, that kind of mapping. The one other thing that I just wanted to, yeah. I wanted to mention along this, which is not MTO specific, but I think also seems like a big challenge for all of the different things that we're talking about, is um, a lot of the focus tends to be on uh, things like data and metrics. And I think the other kind of challenge for practice in the background is also what you might think of as like retail research design, which is to say, like I spend a lot of my time increasingly worrying about crime. And one of the most noteworthy things about, so I don't know how many know anything about crime in the United States, but you will uh, maybe remember that crime rates in the United States went crazy in the late 1980s because someone had the great idea to invent crack cocaine. Yeah. And that spread out everywhere. And so crime rates went crazy everywhere in the United States. And then for some reason, around the early 1990s, the crack epidemic started to break and crime rates plummeted everywhere. Yeah. There is not a single police chief that I know who was in office in the late 1980s who was hailed as a genius. And almost every police chief who was in office in the 1990s yeah has a consulting firm and is making <laughs> millions and millions of dollars yeah. going around to different cities in the United States around the ah, world I saying, look at this incredible yeah. thing that I did to yeah. reduce crime rates by 50% in my city. Yeah. And I think that you know, what we, we cannot live in a world in which the only choice for practitioners is either 
here's my research design. How am I doing today compared to how that I, that I did yesterday? That would lead you to conclude every police chief in the 1980s was an idiot, every police chief in the 1990s was a genius. So that's sort of status quo. The other kind of option under the status quo is let's go out to a research firm and issue an RFP and spend $20 million and do some big study. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need is something that is better than how am I doing today versus yesterday that is not taking us five years to get some research results and can actually give you a more reliable windshield to look through so that you guys can make these mid-course corrections. Because I feel like out in the field right now, nonprofits just do not have that. And I think having something like that would be enormously valuable for, it would have, it would aggregate up to really potentially important insights at a sort of a macro policy level, but I think it would also make everybody's life sort of transformatively better. Yeah, right. I'd like to jump in on that. So Jens made the, a bit of a cunning cheek point about the noticeably different level of excitement around the yes. results in MTO now for economic outcomes yeah. where we've had these other amazing outcomes. But I think part of that story is what was billed at the beginning as the point and what people yeah. were looking for. And so even when we were finding these outcomes in terms of depression and other things, folks felt like there was a little bit of bait and switch going on. Yeah. And I think for me the implication is more conversation on the front end about the variety of potential success measures and outcomes <laughs> that could come out of something. And a really important element of it, including folks on the ground, because a lot of, in our research, we get to go out and ask people, okay, you're a property manager in this mixed income development, or you're a service provider, or you're a resident, what do you think is the point of mixed income housing? And realizing that folks who are on the ground working in the same places with very different sense of what would be success and what they're supposed to be accomplishing, which then leads to the question of, well, how are you guys you know, implementing as a team here if you even have different sets of goals that you're working toward? I think this comes back to the notion of the quarterback or the backbone organization that's helping to say, hold on guys, we haven't yet even designed out what are the variety of levels of success, what's gonna be, uh, when we ask is this working, how we'll be able to define that more clearly. I am hoping someone does additional research on this because I'm thinking in addition to it being an outcome of success that we weren't focused on but that it might be one of the mediating mechanisms in a way that to improve our understanding of the channels so that we might have a mediating outcome, an intermediate that we can look at and whether it isn't part of it. Uh, just given the consistency of some of the results, not, not really, they're not completely consistent given by gender, but um, I think if we don't make traction on that front um, with you on that one, Jens. So I had promised a particular question to the panel that they can turn into, and I'm getting my, ooh, those signs are obnoxious, okay. <laughs> to make sure that we get to open up for the audience uh, for, for conversations, I have a wish list question I'm giving to the panelists, and if it's not the question you want, turn it into whatever you would like. Um, but thinking about making progress going forward, both on the knowledge front and on the practice front. If there was one thing that you think if we knew we could make great, great progress, what is that one thing? Or if you could advise the Secretary of HUD to do one thing, what would it be? Whoever would like to start. And you can change the question. I'll jump in. Good. And I think one key thing, you know, you let off and you framed it nicely, say so it's not either mobility or place based. But I think one thing we can realize is part of the reason for that is not everything works for all families the mm -hmm. same way. So what I would like us to know better is you've got a family sitting in front of you. I'm thinking about a relocation counselor, for example. And if we had better information to understand, here are three, four options, but here's this family, right? Here's the age of their kids. Here's their experience. Here's what you could project their comfort level is going to be, being in a new space cut off from social networks. Some families can handle that and make new connections. For other families, that could be a disaster. So I think if we had better information about which of these strategies might fit best with which kind of households, I think we can arm the folks who are supporting these families to make good choices to make better choices on behalf of themselves. Great. Carolyn, you want to jump in? I'm going to jump in and I'm going to talk about something entirely different. Um, I'm, I have really been struck lately by 
what's happened in Eastlake since the school has reached such high levels of performance over the last five years, where it really has become one of the very best schools. It is a neighborhood school, so kids who live in the villages of Eastlake have the first priority to be able to attend, and then kids who live in the surrounding neighborhood have the next priority, and then to the extent there are spots left over, anybody else in the city of Atlanta can attend. Um, what's happened is um, over the last few years, who lives in the market rate units has changed dramatically. So when we first started, we had lots of double income, no kids in those units, or we had grad students, um, but we didn't have, for the first four or five years, we did not have a single child in the market rate units. Now we have 300, and we see parents driving by shinier, newer, prettier apartments, or foregoing home ownership because they want their kids in this great academic and um, um, environmental ecosystem of great things for kids. And so parents are making the kinds of choices that we're not really surprised that they make, that they're doing what's best for their kids to get their kid in a great school. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that schools become more economically and racially diverse, watching the relationships change between parents and really grow in a way that we were never successful in building just in the housing piece. Um, but where parents are coming together across race and income with their children, um, building really great relationships, um, leading projects together, leading teams together, um, coming to root for where your, your school. It has been a real community building exercise and it has expanded now beyond just parents. Now it's the place where people in the community, even if you don't have kids, come to hear the concerts or come to the basketball game or come to one of the other, the robotics competition. Um, it's, we had a, our, our fourth and fifth graders won this uh, city robotics competition, beating all the high schools a couple of years ago. And there were people who came to watch that who didn't have kids on the team because it was cool. So the school is really becoming a place of community building in a way that we had not seen before. It's just, it's a fascinating um, experiment to watch. And it's interesting. So it start and it started with you, the collection of things that were fixed in the neighborhood and in the housing, such that then the school was able to attract that group. And I wonder if there are also other mechanisms of having it start first with, with school. Yeah, I, I think that you know the, the school had to get really good. It had to be one of oh, the yeah. best schools in the in the oh, city yeah. before people with choice started oh, yeah. choosing to to come. Oh, um, so we were probably ninety percent free and reduced lunch, and one of the top schools in the city. And as a result, people who have moved into the neighborhood um, or were considering moving in the neighborhood planned on flipping their homes, but the Great Recession hit and their houses weren't appreciating as quickly as they had said. I said, huh, maybe I won't have to send my kids to private school or I won't have to move. I will stay and try this new school in our neighborhood. And so we've watched this change over time. It's been fascinating. Can I just, just real quick tag on that, which is the implication, right, in terms of how do you get the housing system and the educational system more aligned mm -hmm. in working together on that front so that you've got schools improving at the same time as housing developments are yeah. and that just yeah. being such the challenge and seeing developer after developer have to kind of refigure that out, reconvince yeah. the school system to work with them in a different kind of way. And so I think it's something that's been done well by this administration is thinking about at the top level mm -hmm. how to have systems right. talk to each other and departments. I think that we've got to continue to push that. And you said developer, but there's, there are system partnerships going on with public housing authorities and educational systems mm -hmm. around the country. That's another version of partnership to line up the housing right. and right. the school right. interest. I, I would just echo that as well. I was trying to think about a concise way to answer your question and uh, talk about both rewarding collaboration among agencies, whether it's housing and school, housing and health, housing and jobs. Um, and to invest in that capacity. And I was thinking about a meeting that our regional administrator from HUD and from the EDA convened with their dozen or so counterparts in the tri-state area and 21 different economic development chiefs and talked about this whole confronting suburban poverty issue and focused on some of the outcomes of the Sustainable Communities mm -hmm. Initiative and just seeing the eyes light up among their peers who weren't so familiar with the Sustainable mm -hmm. Communities Initiative about the value of having a nimble um, sort of sub-regional entity tasked with thinking about housing and jobs and health and education all at the same time and understanding 
that it's going to take years, right, to see the results of different strategies, but we need that kind of investment so it doesn't happen place by place. And then, you know, the one other thing I think about um, in terms of successes, both in opportunity areas, uh, suburban opportunity areas, and in redevelopment in the city, is the critical role of private sector leaders and the business community in particular. I think, you know, I, the, housing, the housing world we were, were I'll, I exclude myself from this, but it's a typically very passionate, articulate, <laughs> knowledgeable group, but we, we tend to talk a lot to each other, and we speak a very specific language of acronyms that, you know, most of our cousins and parents and, um, you know, neighbors don't understand. And we found that the more the business community understands their self-interest in this, the more supportive they will be of elected officials doing the right thing, and the more they can, I'm thinking of the Near West Side Partners Group in Milwaukee right now, and the groups like Marquette University and Miller Coors and Harley Davidson leading the charge around public safety and housing and community development, and what a difference it makes. So, um, you know, there are strategies, tax credit strategies, um, to encourage employers just to think about their self-interest that can really be leveraged in an important way. Okay. Jens, you get last word. Sure. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the research now from Moving to Opportunity, I think, gets, um, will get even more people thinking about the next pragmatic problem, which is how do you help, to the extent to which we're interested in mobility strategies, how do you help low-income families actually move into lower poverty neighborhoods. And my own thinking about this was shaped uh, partly by working on a housing voucher study with Brian Jacob in Chicago, where we saw very low income families who hadn't been subsidized get housing vouchers and basically not change their neighborhood type at all. Uh, very consistent with the HUD Wilfred Work Voucher experiment, I think. And, and I, I think that there is um, a lot of important issues around that that we don't understand right now. We often immediately assume that what is going on are housing supply issues, mm -hmm. discriminate, things like discrimination and availability. I think there's another class of explanation that we understand even less with to some degree on the mm -hmm. housing demand side. So low-income families have social networks. Mm -hmm. If I tried to move my family from Hyde Park right now, my 11-year-old would increase the Chicago homicide count by one. Uh, she'd kill me in my sleep. Um, I think there's another part of it that is, uh, has been really shaped for me by uh, spending a lot of time talking to Kathy Eden as part of this MacArthur net, uh, housing network that I was on for several years about the excruciating trade-off that so many families face between uh, choosing on the unit quality side and the neighborhood quality side. Um, you know, I, in Hyde Park, the what you would uh, pay for a studio apartment would get you a three or four bedroom in Woodlawn or Washington Park. It's a huge difference if you're a mom trying to raise three or four kids. Um, and you know, I think that the, uh, the small area FMR that HUD is experimenting with, I think is hugely interesting to me. And I think the only other sort of piece to this that I think is really interesting that I will put a plug in is I wonder if there is kind of a behavioral science or behavioral economics part to that too that is worth thinking about in the following sense. I'm reflecting on when we moved from DC to Chicago a few years ago. What is very, very easy to see when you are house hunting is what the unit itself is like, how big it is, how nice it is. It is very, very hard during a 30 minute visit to really get a sense of what the neighborhood is like. Or put differently, it feels like the neighborhood is much more of an experience good than yep. is the housing unit, yep. which to the extent to which that's true, seems like it might bake in some bias for families to overweight the importance of the unit. And I think kind of thinking more about how we learn about whether that's actually true and then what you do about it seems like that would also be a very nice, important complementary agenda to the small area FMR. I thought that's a great idea. Um, I, I've heard some qualitative work on that trade-off and an explanation given by some households of what you spend all your time inside. I mean, if you live in, if, if you're, the neighborhoods that are your opportunity set are mainly unsafe uh, to varying degrees, then the, t then the quality of being inside the unit, and you may not even recognize what you would get in a smaller unit yeah. in a safer place. That's really interesting. Okay, we've gone past the time that I've said I would open up to, uh, to questions from the audience, so we are now gonna open up. And the way that we will be doing this is those of you in the auditorium who are interested in asking questions should queue up on the microphone. And please introduce yourself 
and if you have a specific person that you're interested in targeting the question to, say that in your question. And those of you who are online, I'm hoping you have all the information sitting right in front of you on how to tweet your questions. And I will get, I will toggle back and forth between the online questions and the auditorium. And I'm actually going to start here in the auditorium because Mark Short has already stood up. Thank you. Um, so this question is for everybody other than Jens because Jens basically posed the question. Uh, so, we have this finding that from MTO, which was sort of unexpected, that housing made a big difference for, or neighborhood made a big difference for um, uh, health, um, and that that was viewed as a tremendous disappointment because health is so unimportant to all of us. Um, and uh, clearly it's because uh, people don't believe it. So I'm. I know that Carol Lawton's customers don't believe it because she hasn't talked about health at all. She's talked entirely about earnings and education. Um, and um, I basically, and I would imagine that Mark would say it, Mark and Robin would say the same thing. So what will, so what will it take to, to, for, the, uh, for the customers to believe that, ha that housing and neighborhood make a difference to health? Um, one of the things that's really interesting, when we first started in Eastlake and at Drew Charter School, 95% of the kids were overweight. Almost everybody was overweight. And I say this as somebody who has struggled with her weight every day of her life. Um, but almost everybody was overweight. If you come and visit the school now and walk through and look, for, look at the 1,700 kids, I, you will struggle to find a child who is overweight. And that's not because we did an obesity program, but it was because there were a variety of smart decisions that were made um, at the community quarterback level, at the housing level, at the school level, that together have reduced obesity dramatically among the young people in the community. And that's everything from having sidewalks that are well lit and safe to walk on. It's all the kids getting PE three times a week and recess every day. It's not providing transportation to school, so most kids walk up to a mile or a mile and a half both ways to school. Um, it's not having uh, donuts and fish fries as fundraisers anymore, and it's improving the quality of what we serve at the school. So it's a variety of these things that have transformed what a fourth grader weighs, for example. Now, unfortunately, we weren't keeping those records, and the only reason I know that is because I was here in, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I could look at the children and I can see the difference. Um, so we, we, I use that as an example of how health matters, and that matters to people when they come look at the community. It matters to parents when they're coming to look at the school, and you see a student body that is fit and healthy. That makes a difference in what you think your life is going to be like and your child's life is going to be like. So we're not quite marketing it yet as come live in this healthy community, but that's what people are seeing as they come to look at it. So my point was not that health doesn't matter to the audience or the customers. It's just that we were expecting one thing yeah, and then getting another, so that was a problem. But I, don't, I think you'd find most people realizing how much it matters. It's critical as an outcome, but it's also critical, and you talked about the pathways. Yeah. Yeah. It's critical, and when we're talking about this mobility discussion, to someone being able to effectively search and find new housing for a family, if you're in poor health, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, end of story right there. Some of the interviewing that we did early on in the Chicago public housing transformation is to go find folks who are in the process of either being in a development and being relocated or they had been relocated. And what I saw in terms of some of just the personal conditions, the lack of, talk about mobility, physical mobility within your unit, yeah. let alone you got to get out, get on the bus, go check out neighborhoods, meet with various people. Mm -hmm. And so that took a whole bunch of people out of the equation. And we asked, you know, why do people feel like ultimately they didn't get their choice of where they wanted to be? their health prevented them from being able to really make that search. So I think health is critical at both levels, but I think the folks on the ground very much understand that. You're allowed to speak even if Mark didn't say. I mean, the, only, the only thing that I, I just want to say is, uh, is I really do, I, I don't, uh, I, it, it does make me a little uneasy for, uh, for, for us to say, with one sentence, of course health is important, and then spend three minutes as opposed to 10 seconds talking about how important health is for searching for an apartment. Imagine that your spouse or your kid was clinically depressed and you go to them and say, 
Honey, I'm so deeply worried about your depression because it's slowing down our house search. Right? I mean, there's something like these are families. If someone in your family was clinically depressed, the last thing that you would care about is how hard it is to search for an apartment. You would be deeply worried about their depression for its own sake. So I don't think that we need to feel defensive and say, oh yeah, clinical depression, it's so important for this or that other thing that we're supposed to care about. It is really, really important. And just, just introspect on your own family and I think you will immediately see that all these things that we are undervaluing right now are hugely important. So do we have, um, first I'm going to check to see whether you have somebody online. No questions so far. Okay. Kurt. Hi. A um, couple things. Uh, on the health aspect, you know, we've got, this, we've, got, we've got this finding that incomes of children who are young children when they moved are much better. What the hell is the mechanism, right? Well, maybe health of the parents is one of the mechanisms. Yeah. Um, yeah. My theory is maybe uh, lower probability of, of uh, involvement in the criminal justice system. I mean, another mechanism. Um, but I have a different question. Uh, this is for Robin Snyderman. Um, the Cook County Housing Authority is one of our demonstration sites for a small area of fair market rents. Was, and you, you, you didn't mention whether or not those are being used in your, your programs or um, if you could comment on, on what's going on there. I don't know all that much about it. Housing Authority of Cook County is one of the nine very active, um, very supportive partners in the regional housing initiative. And I recall at the beginning there was some reluctance to the small FMR program like, um, you know, happens. But I, I, I know that their staff have been among the leading um, um, applauders of this initiative now and that it's one of the tools that that we want to look at this next year in terms of bringing to scale lessons learned in Cook County. So really all I could say is I know they were not so sold at the beginning and now after piloting it for a while are encouraging their peers to consider something similar. That's probably all you want to know, right? That's good to hear. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leah Elliott. I'm interning with Strong City, Strong Communities. And I was just wondering, Mark, you talked about um, needing to focus on activating the mix and the us versus them dynamic to focus on. I was curious, Carol, if you could speak at all about any course corrections that you found in East Lake or other communities to address that beyond what happened maybe naturally when the schools got better and the families were just interacting more. And then also, Robin, at the planning level, the us versus them mentality, how what strategies have you seen being used successfully at the planning level to get at that across different municipalities and um, the county versus the smaller areas? So I'd love to just hear more about that. I've got a good example, I think, for you. Um, in the early days of Eastlake, and keep in mind that Eastlake was the third mixed income deal to close. So it was really early on in the mixed income uh, evolution. We had our first phase closing in March of, um, or December of 1996. So we're going back away. So when the first families moved in, uh, market rate and um, public housing assisted, we found that there were a couple of cultural issues that were coming at play that we needed to decide what, were, what was going to be the, the practice in our neighborhood. And one of them was where one entertained and in public housing, people traditionally had entertained outside of their apartment, and sometimes that meant bringing their furniture outside and, and hanging out outside. And in, um, in higher income neighborhoods, people typically would entertain either in their apartment or in their backyard, not out front. Um, and so we had to have a conversation that because so, some of the public housing assisted residents had taken their practice from the old East Lake Meadows days of bringing the furniture out front and setting up, and some of the um, market rate families were offended by that practice and um, and so I was the uh, head of the Eastlake Foundation then in the community quarter in the community quarterback role so we had to create a space to have a conversation not saying one way was better than another but how did we want to be what was the practice going to be in our neighborhood and so we had three or four meetings over the course of a couple of months to talk about this and ultimately decided that we were going to um, not bring our furniture out in front, that we were going to entertain inside and on patios and on balconies, and we were going to create a new area 
uh, outside that had grills and patio tables and other places. So for when people wanted to entertain, there was a place for them to do so that didn't require them to bring bring their stuff outside. That's just a small example, but those are the kinds of kind of little cultural things that can get in the way of building community. And if there's not somebody who's willing to have those uncomfortable conversations and facilitate them, it can really get in the way of success. If I could just jump in on yes. just that for a quick second. Partly it's what's decided, it's getting to the compromise, but partly what's really important in Carol's story is how the compromise was reached, right? And very often what we see in many mixed income developments is you'll have condo associations and then you have other tenant groups, or sometimes there isn't even another association. And the condo association gets together, votes, meets, discuss the problem, decide, and here's the solution. And so I think that component of it that's about, it's our community and we're gonna talk this out. And even if it's a decision that at the end of the day you wouldn't have chosen, you got to hear the rationale, and you got to be part of that conversation, which I think is really critical. Um, and I wanna make sure, I, I think that your question for me had to do with us versus them among municipal leaders competing across borders potentially, but also to some extent maybe the, the misconception that it's us versus them in terms of who is allowed to move into a community or be part of these decisions. And the, you know, the, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus in Chicago has been up and running now since the late 1990s, but it didn't start around, it started around economic development and air quality and issues like that that it was easier to bring people together on. And it wasn't really until the data came out and showed that while jobs and population were booming in the suburbs, not only was the home ownership rate out of reach to the entry level workforce, but the rental stock actually got decreased in the same period of time that entry level workers were meeting out there. And um, you know, the, the researchers, the headline was non-economic barrier, non-economic barriers are guiding the marketplace. Traditional models of supply and demand aren't at work. And, um, so uh, the mayor's caucus wisely at that time pulled mayors together to really just decide what they wanted to do about it. And to be frank, it took a year um, of discussion about how to proceed to even discuss this issue before they came up with a housing action strategy that has been moving rapidly ever since. But there were many stories about mayors taking leadership on this issue and then getting voted out of office before an ordinance get, could get passed or a development built. So again, they came up with these criteria I described earlier, affordable to the local workforce and a range of others, well-managed, well-designed, near jobs, near transit. That took a year. <laughs> but the same day they came up with that communication vehicle, they passed a really wise housing action agenda that said, all right, if, it, if housing meets this criteria, we need to preserve it. If we don't have enough of it, we need to build it. If the state's not rewarding us for for building it, we need those incentives. We need to pass incentives along to our developers. And the big one was we need to work differently with our housing authorities to promote the right mix of options that meet our criteria. So we had to use that criteria to get this whole regional housing initiative uh, um, approved. But then a big finding after we started to ce celebrate little successes in ordinance here or development here was the realization that we could that these drop in the buckets were all exciting were not really so helpful in the scheme of things unless mayors work together across borders. And it was actually mayors in opportunity areas in the northwest suburbs who, who started to think interjurisdictionally, and then the foreclosure crisis hit. And what we thought was a cool idea all of a sudden was an imperative, that the hardest hit part of our state, the south suburbs, um, had the highest foreclosure rates in the state, not as many as the city of Chicago, but a higher percentage. But the way the federal formulas worked is they were set up to compete for dollars, not once at the state level, but twice at the county level. And frankly, they weren't competitive for any applications because they didn't have the track record or the capacity. So at the time, they didn't get any money from the state. And it really wasn't until Brooking sort of put the magnifying glass on it and helped um, reward just you know, through publications, the leadership and the courage of the mayors to think across borders strategically to come up with an application that had them not competing, but thinking about how to build on this, that it went the distance. And again, after that struggle at the local level, HUD's Sustainable Communities Initiative awarded the South, the West, and the region, and it was that reward. <laughs> it was the financial incentive from the public sector and philanthropy that's kept it going, and we need, we need more, more rewards. Now let's take another question from Great. our followers on Twitter. Uh, someone observes, community quarterback, the community quarterback role is so important to neighborhood change. 
how do we find the Peyton Mannings of the community development world? Should we institute a draft? I'm so glad that that question was asked. Um, the, the comment that Robin made earlier about needing to get civic and business leaders involved in this work, broadening, broadening the constituency of people who care about the neighborhoods that we all care about is imperative. Um, and in our model, the community quarterback board is traditionally made up of very effect, effective civic and business leaders. Um, it's not mayors, it's not public appointees, it is civic and business leaders who are willing to use their relationships, their chits, their influence for the benefit of this revitalization. And I think they're hungry for a place to plug in because too often they haven't been invited to be part of the conversation. And um, the examples that Robin shared in Milwaukee and Chicago and other places are great examples of that. But look to the people who have stood up to help fix things in your community before? Who are the folks who have stood up on um, public hospital boards, for example, who have helped get those um, righted when they were falling astray? Um, who are the folks that you might look to at a regional level um, to be part of that civic and business leader to get anything done? Those are the folks that you want to attract to this work. Um, I think you'll find that they'll be excited to be invited. Again, an example in Cook County of how now that there's a plan in place approved by the board that links housing and jobs, you know, that was a big, that was a big change, starting to convene foundations and banks and the business community to say, here's what we can fund with our public sector dollars, but we, we need your help investing in these quarterbacks. Right now, this isn't an easy flow for public sector dollars. And in the Chicago region, it really has been philanthropy that stepped up initially to just seed these initiatives. And the more I think the, the philanthropy and the public sector are working together through many of the initiatives at HUD and on the ground through local innovation, the more, the more we can continue through nimble, nimble strategies. We're actually at time, but I feel terribly guilty because Jade has been so patient. So I am going to take us past the hour on a short targeted question from Jade so we can end on this. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. I work in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, and I was really struck by uh, Carol's story about Drew Charter School and how the improvements in the school led to an increase in um, uh, families with children in the market rate apartments. And uh, the question came to mind for me, if you had to choose between building better housing and increasing the quality of schools, in order to increase, to improve a neighborhood, which would you choose? That's the marketing oh, dollar question. I don't know. You question. went to not both and, it's either or. No, I, I, th I think they are both. I'm going to refuse yeah. to answer that because they're both important. Um, getting the housing right and great, delivering a great quality school is the secret for neighborhood success. Um, you know, health equals neighborhoods. And, um, so I'm going, to I'm going to end on that note of suggesting that sometimes, because we are looking at the margin and, have to, and think of making those hard choices, if the model and what it takes us to do something right is different and then we go the shortcut way, we're not going to get the effects that we want. I um, want to thank the panel for this. This was a fantastic way for me to spend the afternoon and I really appreciate your coming in to join us on this topic of really, I can't really think of a more important topic. So join me in, well, in thanking the panel for their work.